Hi, hello, I'm Joan from Reading with Joan. Welcome to my channel. Kindly remember to like, comment and subscribe to our channel today. We love reading with you and interacting with our kids. On our Wednesday time, we read and on Saturday, we talk and we just talk, talk about morals, talk about things that are related to our culture because we want kids to be culturally aware. We want kids to grow up to be very responsible and independent individuals. I hope you will join us Wednesday and Saturday. Remember, like, comment, and share our channel with your friends and family. We hope you enjoy reading with us today. Hello kids! I'm really having a fabulous time reading all the stories from China from the Wisdom Tale. Today's story is A Farmer's Horse Ran Off. Another story from China, like I said. Let's dig in. A farmer's horse ran off and tried as he might, the farmer could not catch him. His neighbor, seeing this, rushed to the farmer's side and said, how bad for you. Now you have no horse to haul your wood. The farmer looked at the dust in the distance and said, I don't know if it's bad or if it's good. The next day, the horse came back with a mate, a beautiful wild mare it had found in the field. When the neighbor saw two horses and the farmer's stall, he said, how good of you, you must be glad. Once again, the farmer said, I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. The next day, the farmer's son decided to tame the wild mare, the wild horse. The horse threw the boy and stepped on his legs in many places. The farmer rushed into the field. And as he lifted his broken boy, the neighbor saw what had happened. And the neighbor ran to the farmer and said, Oh, how bad for you. Your sorrow is understood. The farmer looked up with tears in his eyes. And once again, I don't know if it's bad or if it's good. In time, the country went to war. All the able-bodied youths were conscripted. Around The farmer with his hand around his limping boy, the neighbor stood alongside the road as rows upon rows of young men marched off to the battlefield. The neighbor wiping tears from his eyes as he waved goodbye to his own two sons who worked away with sturdy stripes. He turned to the farmer and said, how good for you. Your son is home. You must be glad. Again, the farmer sighed. I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. This is the story with at end. Take it from what you will, my friend. Don't you just like the life lessons in the story? One thing I learned, the neighbor is always never minding his own business. Kids, have you learned to mind your business? I learned a lesson from the farmer. He never considered everything to be boastful or proud of or shout about. He sorted that in everything he would be thankful he doesn't know whether it's good or bad, but he will be satisfied with whatever he had. He was satisfied when he lost his horse. He was satisfied when the horse became two horses. He was sorrowful when his son became lame, but he was still okay with it. He was contented. What are you not contented about? What are you always putting your mouth into another person's business and finding out, okay, oh, that is happening to you. That you know that some people all they do all the long is to find out what is happening about another person. Until they themselves lose their sons because they always want to judge others. 
What are you judging others or mirroring others about? Learn from the wise farmer. I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. I would rather just stay in the middle and watch how things turns out because life is always filled with lessons. It never tells you what is going to, what is around the corner. Life always surprises you, kids. The fact that you are okay today doesn't mean that you'll be okay all the time. The only constant thing is change. So let's be mindful how we treat others, how we mind other, how we put our mouth in other people's business, and how we deal with things. From reading with John, another wise lesson today. I'll see you next time. Hi everyone, welcome to Reading a Joan. I'm Big J, and today we're going to read The Jungle Doctor in Slippery Places by Paul White. Today we're reading Chapter 6, Punda and Pili Pili. Let's go. Listen, shouted Tembo. From ahead came the rumble of an earth-moving machine. Punda, you and I have five days done the work of 500 hoes, a deep cheerful voice said. We, seeing Baruti and Tembo and Noha struggling through the tall elephant grasses, their strange burden, he stopped and leaned out of the window. They greeted him. What is your news? He replied. Then he saw the python tied into the pole. Yo! He laughed. That is a way of comfort for a snake to travel. Barutium did the knot in a shirt sleeve that covered the reptile's head. The cold eyes of an indignant python looked at him unwinkingly. The driver of the machine laughed. I am Pili Pili. He turned to Barutium the others. Punda. Who has the strength of a thousand donkeys joins me in greeting you all. Where do you travel? Baruti leaned up his end of the pole against a great yellow machine. We travel first to the house of the game scout and then to see Buana Colongo. He, a thing of joy and merit, believably slapped his thigh. I will save your feet much walking, for at my camp is a jeep which will carry the creature that rests on that pole to Mabwe, that he may meet the area commissioner, Colongo, who I know is small during reptiles. And Punda here, who is an animal of understanding and obedience, will save your feet still further. Let her carry the sweller of goats. Just watch her cleverness. Let her carry the sweller of goats. Just watch her cleverness. He pointed to a variety of levers and knobs. Pull this, she bent her neck. Push that, she opened her neck. Pull, pull, gently. Do not let her harm my snake, shouted Baruti. It's filled with shillings. Money that means that Tempo here can continue his studies. Pili Pili chuckled. <laughs> Is that so? Never fear. Who has the mouth of the lion but a gentleness of a rat? He pushed a lever. Baruti guided the pole so that it was grass in the iron jaws. The snake was swung into the air. Pili Pili called. Come up here with me. The legs of Punda have much strength. After they had traveled some distance, Baruti said, Since you delivered this small snake for me, we will return to Noah's house in the village of Fuhari. It is well, said Pili Pili. Punda and I approve. There is a road that runs into the swamp. Halfway, it splits. Each part is very much like the other. The swamp on each side is full of the same thick mud and the same tall reeds. But Nungo, the village at one end, is truly called a place of smells. And those who live there, he rolls his eyes expressively. For Ferrari, the other village is in another matter. He swung the wheel and they stopped at a camp, a courtyard surrounded by locked, corrugated iron buildings to which was bolted strong steel mesh. Pili Pili unlocked a door and drove a jeep out, parking it close to Punda. He produced a length of rubber hose, one end of which went to the interior of the earth moving machine. The other he covered with a large finger. Keep the food for these machines in the large stomach of Punda, and the thieves and Nungo are empty handed. He put the hose in the finger into his mouth and sucked. A large smell suddenly covered his face. The inexperienced spider mouse full of the fluid beloved by motors with a small joy to men. He pushed the hose into the fuel tank of the jeep and removed his finger. Fuel flowed evenly through the hose. Baruti rolled his eyes. How is it that this happens? Billy Billy was delighted. It is a piece of cunning. Using a tube like this at the end of the tank, higher than the other one, the fluid, then fluid which fills the tube will run uphill before it goes. This is called a siphon. Interesting, said Baruti, having more of that tube. Billy Billy carefully removed the hose. Wana Kalongo has a great real thick hose coiled upon it. Why do you ask? My head fills with ideas, said Baruti. A girl came along the road carrying two bowls, one on top of the other. 
She turned in at the gate. Here comes food, cried Pretty Piggy. Eat to me. They had finished their meal when four other public works department men arrived. Pilly Pilly greeted them. You have come of the tired joy. We have a journey to Mabway and a special visitor for Wana Congo who will be carried with us. When they saw the visitor was a snake, his companions lost some of their enthusiasm for the safari. However, when they were sure it was securely tied, they climbed into the jeep. Pilly Pilly wrote the pole to the roof so that the python's head stuck far out beyond the bonnet and its tail was way behind the exhaust pipe. He yelled for a while and as the headlights cut their way into the night, Baruti, Tembo, and Noha trudged onto Fahar. Noha pointed with his chin. Follow that road, and you will arrive at Nungo. The moon was full. Baruti could see the dark waters on either side of the track. They seemed surrounded with a dank smell of decaying plant life. Yuck! Frogs and crickets sang a doleful duet. Mosquitoes rose in swarms. Close behind them, a hyena howled. I was answered in the young Nongho bank. On the night hair came the beating of drums in an ugly rhythm that told of death. Yakobo locked his door as he heard the same drums. There was a tense feeling in the village of Nongho. Hardly a light showed anywhere. As he listened, he heard muffled footsteps. There was a tense feeling in the village of Nongho. Hardly a light showed anywhere. As he listened, he heard muffled footsteps going past his house. Irritably, he switched off his radio and started counting his money to try to forget this disturbing sound. But, unbidden, his memory recalled the verse. What shall it profit a man if he gains a whole world and loses his own soul? At last, the village merged into an, easy, an uneasy silence, and Yakobo went to bed, but not to sleep. Through his mind, the words repeated themselves. What shall it profit? What shall it profit? Eighty kilometers away, Pili Pili and his friends were arriving at Mabwe. They swung past the jail. Within those walls are Lugu and Dola, Pili Pili explained, made a long stay out of the Malanga country. He bumped over the railway line. Soon they were outside the area commissioner's house. An hour before, a wary Nelson Colongo had gone to bed. He was sound asleep when Pili Pili came to his door, calling insistently to be let in. He woke, stumbled out of bed, turned on the light, and yawning widely, opened the front door to be confronted by a group of grinning people holding a large bamboo pole on one, on one end, which was only an arm's length from its eyes. It was then that he saw the python's head. With an effort, he stood his ground. Wana is he? grinned Pili Pili. Baruti has been at work, and he said that you would want this one as soon as possible, so he brought him a speed. You did right, said the area commissioner softly, but there was one further thing you must do. Carry this creature to the house of the Americans. It's his free gateway to the east. They love reptiles, these people. Take this one there and leave it there. He closed the door unnecessarily hard. Pili Pili chuckled. <laughs> Perhaps he has no peace in his stomach. Certainly there is no joy in his head. Certainly there is no joy in his head. Thank you for reading The Jungle Doctor and Slippery Places with me. Next week we'll be reading Chapter 7 with Little J. And I'll see you next time. Bye! I thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you next time on another story time with Joan. Reading with Joan. Bye.